Part 1 Origins From Belisarius to Cincinnatus to Washington, it's been said that those who are the most responsible with great amounts of power have very little interest in holding it. When House Davion Admiral Julius Santiago Avalar witnessed the horrors of interstellar war between the houses of the Inner Sphere, he resolved to one day abandon the capricious and cruel structures behind. He sought a path forward for humanity that didn't include increasingly violent and devastating conflict. He ended up a reluctant leader of many who shared this outlook as the 24th century came to a close. Settling on the only recently colonized planet of Alpharats in 2413, Avalar planned to live out his remaining years in isolation and peace. As with the previously mentioned historical leaders, this plan would not end up playing out as Avalar had expected. Unable to keep quiet, hey, we've all been there, Avalar shared his opinions concerning the increasingly frequent conflicts across the stars, especially between House Davion and House Corita. He must have been particularly compelling in his rhetoric because word spread far beyond Alpharads and reached the ears of many ordinary citizens of the nearby regions who interpreted his arguments as a call to action. As time passed, Avalar started to see more and more people arrive at Alpharads on dropships with each supply run. Often, they'd seek him out for guidance and assistance in settling on the planet. The idea that there must be a way for humanity to continue that doesn't revolve around producing and using military technology was just too powerful to ignore. Soon the new arrivals outnumbered the original colonists. Not long after that, waves of new arrivals completely overwhelmed the colony. Julius Avalar ended up the de facto leader of a considerably high population planet on the edge of colonized space. Avalar's beliefs were institutionalized as a number of citizens required official organization. The result was an equivalent of a parliamentary monarchy where Avalar and his team were the executives in charge of carrying out the laws enacted by the People's Assembly. The Alliance Charter, which was ratified in 2417, sets up the structure for a divided government that, with checks and balances, along with guarantees of basic rights for the citizenry. Fans of the 21st century representative governments would see a lot of similarities between their systems and the Outworld's alliance. Each planet within the alliance elected a parliament which had members elected through popular vote. These parliaments then elected one person to act as the executive for a three-year term. All of this fell under the umbrella of the executive parliamentary control, but that control was rarely ever exercised. A system of courts and a military review board were also set up to deal with disputes both internal and external. The Military Review Board made decisions concerning defense of the Alliance beyond planetary garrisons. All of these structures were deliberately designed to move very slowly. Laws and reforms took a very long time to pass, if they passed at all. It was a government that barely worked, and that's how Avalar liked it. A restrained government was a government that was unlikely to become a totalitarian empire builder. If the Outwards Alliance had a mission statement, it would probably be best summed up with the phrase, Stay Alive. In the first 200 years of its existence, the lack of substantive trade with the Inner Sphere left the Outworlds pretty destitute, especially in areas of advanced technology. Some planets were reported to have fallen to states more similar to the mid and late Industrial Revolution on Terra than that of a spacefaring civilization. The peaceful early years of the Outworlds Alliance were not to last forever. In 2572, the Star League decided that no one was allowed to be left alone, so garrisons consisting of Combine soldiers and hegemony units would quote-unquote protect the planets from pirates and other possible threats. The actual reason for this presence was an implied threat against the Alliance, which had begun to make some moves towards building a domestic military force. Unable to muster really any sort of defense, the people of the Outwards Alliance were then inundated by these outsiders with a very different understanding of appropriate behavior. Rough treatment and a general lack of respect from the Star League garrisons inevitably led to conflict by the locals, who saw them as an occupying force that did nothing but harm. On Santiago, in the capital city, Santiago City, these frustrations boiled over into violence. On December 14, 2572, a mech warrior piloting a locust was set upon by children wielding snowballs, as had become a local tradition. Annoyed by their actions, the mech warrior tossed a canister of coolant down onto the children, and this resulted in one child receiving serious burns. This act of violence riled up the crowd, which turned into an angry mob of locals, which surrounded the Locust. Unable to clear a path, the Locust mech warrior tried to move through them, but ended up tripping. The battle mech crashed to the ground, crushing several people underneath. 
This really set things off, as the locals began to hit the fallen mech with all sorts of objects. In a panic at this point, the mech warrior opened fire with the mech's two machine guns, spraying the crowd with fire. 27 civilians were killed by the time the mech exited the area away from the fleeing crowds. The Santiago Massacre became a rallying cry for the discontent of periphery citizens, not just in the Outworlds Alliance, but across the other periphery nations. If the stationing of Star League soldiers on periphery worlds was intended to defuse the threat, the result was the exact opposite. As we mentioned in previous videos, the Pollux Proclamation of 2575 was, in all intents and purposes, a declaration of war by the Star League against any state and planetary system that still hung on to the delusion that they could be independent. Part 2. The Reunification War Unable to do much of anything to defend themselves from the SLDF and the Draconis Combine, the President of the Outworlds Alliance stalled and made gestures seeking peace until 2581 when it became obvious that an invasion was coming. President Grigori Avalar was desperate at that point and sought out the only other possible ally in the situation, House Davion. An offer was made to hand over a dozen of the Alliance's wealthier planets near the Davion border in exchange for military support. Seeing an opportunity to gobble up territory while also hampering the efforts of the Dracronos Combine, three regiments of House Davion troops would act as overt and covert forces to hamper the invasion. They operated under the name Pitcarn Legion and proceeded to throw a wrench into the gears of every SLDF and Combine operation possible. They would hit a location hard, then retreat to dropships before the Star League forces could react effectively. On the planets granted to House Davion by the Alliance, the new owners caused additional logistics issues with the SLDF by denying supplies and sometimes even outright refusing to allow dropships to land on the worlds. All of this was done under the flimsiest of excuses including mismatched paperwork and just an inefficient bureaucracy. Irritated and frustrated by what had become an interstellar guerrilla war, the Combined Forces and the SLDF responded by targeting population centers for decimation and destruction of crucial infrastructure. This led to even more local opposition to the Star League by the Outworlders who rushed to sign up for planetary militias for the opportunity to hit back. In 2585, the entire invasion had devolved into a quagmire which was draining Star League and Combined Forces at an unacceptable rate. The Peace of Cerberus ended the reunification war for the Outworld Alliance under terms which were fairly advantageous for the Outworlders. Part 3. Succession Wars and Beyond in the years following the Reunification War, the Outworlds Alliance was able to rebuild and even thrive thanks to trade and technology grants from the Star League. There was relatively little in the way of opposition to the new norm across the Outworlds and the SLDF forces ended up being completely withdrawn by 2607. The collapse of the Star League into civil war placed the Outworlds Alliance into a quandary. The president at the time, Elise Avalar, ended up declaring neutrality. While it could be confused as savvy political acumen, it was really much more like a result of just chronic indecision. As the inner sphere and periphery states descended into a civil war and then the succession wars, the Outworlds Alliance survived largely unscathed. The most notable negative impact was the loss of trade routes with the Warring Houses which resulted in a lower quality of life for the Outworlders due to the loss of technology over time and the lack of foreign produced goods. Some effort was put into building relationships with House Davion and the Draconis Combine, which has helped the economies of the Outworlds Alliance planets. Additionally, Comstar was welcomed more warmly than in other locations around the periphery. Comstar provided jobs, and the construction of HPGs on several planets within the Alliance generated commercial opportunities. In general, the quality of life improved on average across the Outworld Alliance, but at a rate generally below most of the other periphery states. Over time, military spending was increased, and the Alliance Mechworks produces the Locust, Stinger, and Wasp battle mechs. Most of the spending went into developing aerospace assets, which offered the largest return on their investment. This would end up playing an interesting role in later history. In many ways, the Outworlds Alliance benefited from the relative lack of wealth and military power. Not considered a threat, but not wealthy enough to plunder, the Outworlders seemed to avoid a lot of the war and predation that took place elsewhere in the inner sphere and periphery. With the arrival of the clans in the Inner Sphere, the attention and nominal support from the Combine and House Davion dried up. This might have been a bigger problem, but the banditry that would have otherwise cropped up in Alliance space ended up occurring on richer house-held worlds instead. When I taught, I used to share this saying with students. 
You don't have to be the fastest gazelle in the savannah, but you do have to be slightly faster than the slowest. If you can internalize why that is the case, I think we understand how the Outworld Alliance has managed to stay off the radar for so long. Part 4. A New Direction The Outworld's Alliance was doing its thing and largely staying out of trouble until March of 3056, when there was a pretty significant changing of the guard. President Neil Avalar, great name by the way, announced that he was ready to retire and his son Mitchell would be taking over. Not one to sit around and be idle, Mitchell Avalar announced a series of reforms that would significantly change the alliance. The Long Road Program, as it was called, was a series of economic, military, and legal reforms which were intended to advance the Outworld's alliance into a much more prosperous level. Trade deals with House Davion allowed for the exploitation of resources in exchange for profit sharing and the use of Outworld or labor, which boosted the economy on multiple planets. Some of those resources were then funneled into new refineries and factories that began to produce goods and technology, usually imported at a higher cost. The rewards from these reforms manifested faster than predicted, and President Avalar saw widespread approval of his measures. Aerospace production was expanded, along with some of the best laser systems built in the periphery states. It wasn't long until the Outworld's Alliance earned a reputation for quality goods. To protect all of this new wealth, the Alliance Military Corps was expanded, with a heavy focus on the Alliance Aerospace Arm, which was considered the first line of defense in case of invasion by pirates or even a hostile state. With more than 300 aerospace fighters across the AAA, it's a powerful first line which could hobble all but the largest invasions. With the focus on aerospace assets, it's not a surprise that it would eventually gain the attention of Clan Snow Raven. In one of the more bizarre pieces of history from the post-3060s, a Snow Raven fleet stumbled upon an Outworld's Alliance jump ship. Seeing an opportunity for an easy win, they staged a trial of possession for it. The fight turned into an unexpected brawl as the AAA fighters began to beat the Snow Raven pilots handily. Instead of claiming the jump ship, the Snow Ravens offered friendship to the Outworld's Alliance. This unlikely new relationship aided both sides as the Snow Ravens could use recharging stations and resupply at Outworld's Alliance systems, and the Alliance could receive technical assistance in refurbishing an old Star League-era naval base and have a powerful ally in defending Outworld Alliance planets. Following the word of Blake Kerfuffle and the Wars of Reaving, the Snow Ravens found themselves and their considerable fleet and aerospace assets without a place to call home. Though the relationship with the Outworld's Alliance was not perfect, it was one of the only locations where the Snow Raven could go that wouldn't result in being wiped out by other clans or interstellar forces. Details on who and what exactly happened are kind of sketchy, but at some point during the Dark Age, the Snow Ravens officially merged their remaining citizenry into the Outworld's Alliance, forming the Raven Alliance. As of 3083, the new state would include 41 settled worlds. The future of the people that once lived within this Outworld's Alliance is kind of uncertain at this point in the Ill Clan era. It'll be interesting when we finally get some information from one of the periphery's bigger independent states. I'm not sure if I have a prediction for what might happen moving forward. However, it's nearby where my new Explorer Corps series starts off, so perhaps they will visit the Raven Alliance soon to see what's up. If there's no lore, it's open season, right? Thanks for watching. Big thank you to those who support through Ko-Fi and the new YouTube channel members that have been flooding in the past day. It's been heartening to know that there are people out there who have enough confidence in what I'm doing to step up like that. I appreciate it. If you are not able to go that far, make sure you do hit that like and subscribe button so that YouTube knows it's a video worth advertising to others. Our next periphery video should be a fun one. I'm looking forward to it. Until then, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.